equipped with another class to make sure that we're ready. Yeah, so we're just going to come in here two weeks from today and take that test. And it won't be in class, but you'll get a lot of time for it. Like on Monday. Now, homework, this, the due date for this week's homework was changed to Thursday. Can we take it early or late? Take the final? No. Early? Oh. <laughs> now I can't have go one on vacation? exam one day. Huh? You want to go on vacation? No. So I can't have one exam on one day and the other on the next day. And so I don't get stuck in an exam. I don't remember what lecture yeah. number this is. Well, oh, I had three finals. Is it 24? So. 25? I don't yeah. remember. That's it doesn't good. matter that much because they keep track of it. Yeah, we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Nicholas does. Thank you very much. And um, I didn't look on the website this morning as well. It's the last one on the website. It's, uh, it's 23, Tuesday, November 21, lecture 23. Oh, well, that must be done at 24 then. Yeah, sure. Okay. Well, we took care of it, Nicholas. Okay. <laughs> um, What are your questions about the homework? I know there were a bunch of comments on the syllabus uh, about corrections that had a whole paragraph of comments. If you didn't have a look at it yet, maybe you should look now. Anybody not have a look at these? Great, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Let's see, there's a bunch of comments there. I'm, I'll give up until the copy in just a second. But so you asked the answer to number 49 or 49? Like, I can't get those answers from problem what you die. I'm like, how do they do that? I'm like, there's no way. Okay, that was a change, but I'm going to have the last homework due, and I didn't. I might as well write that up. I haven't put it on the website. It's due Tuesday, right? We do Tuesday, homework 12. We do December 5th. Where's And it's right here, chapter 7. Oh. Write it down and I'll put it on the website too. I'm making one of the problems extra credit because it's too lengthy. It's going to rehash the data that was in here. Remember that problem that had the one, the same, the, the population of size five that had two, five numbers one, two, two, four, and eight. You took a sample of size two and you uh -huh. beat it to death with a fairy. And your hand computation as well. Do the same thing again, <laughs> only with the theory of this last section. Okay, that's the extra credit problem. Okay. What this is is yet another way to uh, estimate the population parameter mu in this last section um, that we're going to do today. Um, when you have some, you know more information about the population, the structure of the population of, of values. So it's going to be back to uh, one variable. We're going to go back to one variable. The two variable case with the ratio estimator, that was, now we're pretty much through that. You're finishing it now. Yeah. I don't understand this chapter, I guess. What's the point? Because does that actually work? Does the sample this is what statisticians stuff? do. It's yeah, but like, money, man. Yeah, but, the, <laughs> but is it biased or is it unbiased? When they do like, like on TV, you see like votes and stuff. They do a sort of sample or yeah, whatever of people, very and good. then they do something with it. Of course, it. it's biased. Huh? Of course, it's biased. But the question is, is it reliable? Well, it's biased. There's there's no point if it's biased. Might be a point. If the bias is small, it's, there's a point. But aren't they supposed to be unbiased? The okay. surveys and stuff? Well, it might, like that, the question right? is if it's unbiased, but the discrepancy is big. In other words, okay, I've got an unbiased estimator of uh, probably the coin lands of heads, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And the unbiased estimator, you know, ranges between 0.3 and 0.7. Okay? And it's, you know, lots of time it's not even close to 0.5. Okay? Mm -hmm. Versus one that's biased. It always it's, it has a little bit of bias, so that actually if I took the average of all the numbers that we come up that I come up with for estimators, right? Come up with estimates. I always come up with an estimate, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and if I average all those estimates that I ever come up with, let's say it came up to 0.52, mm -hmm. okay, so it's biased.
things. There's a bias. But let's say, mm -hmm. but let's say, um, it always comes out, you know, but, but let's say the variability is very small. Okay? Mm -hmm. So it might be a little bit better estimated. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It comes up 0.53, you know, instead mm -hmm. of 0.52 when it's supposed to be 0.50 versus something that says 0.60 or 0.40. Okay? All the time. Is that better? Which is better, 0.6 and 0.4 or 0.53? If you're trying to estimate 0.5, <laughs> okay? <laughs> you see? <laughs> so the other estimator maybe will always be between 0.51 and 0.53, so it won't actually average to 0.5. Okay, but it's, it's, it's a little bit closer to the truth, hmm. right? Most of the time. Oh. Because of the, because of the uh, smaller variability. So we talk about the good the comparing two estimators by the mean square error. That's what we talked about, the MSE. So we're comparing MSEs. So if something can be biased, but have a small MSE compared to another estimator. I can actually we can actually compare in a kind of a trivia case, you can actually compare uh, two different uh, estimators of the variance. Right? Which is the which is the better estimator? S squared equals 1 over n minus 1 summation xi minus x bar squared, okay? Or sigma hat squared equals 1 over n summation xi minus x bar squared. It wouldn't matter. Which one is better? Okay. It wouldn't matter. Like, for example, it's huge. What if the sample's not huge? Which is a better estimate? This one or this one? Oh. How do you know? It's a guess. Intuition. Intuition. Very good intuition. Okay. <laughs> what you can actually do is you compare these two things. You can actually, and so these are both estimators of sigma squared, right? One of them is bot. In, let's say in the independent sample case, assume um, x1, x1, x2, up to xn are independent n0 of 1. Okay, let's just say, ah, uh, well, n is that n gives sigma squared, I guess. I'll make it more general. Okay? Take the independent normal case. So this is not the same case of this chapter because you don't have independent normals. Okay? Because our samples are dependent in all of these examples. How many? Oh, because <laughs> because you sample without replacement. Mm -hmm. With the urn, if the urn size is very very big, then you you have all roughly independence. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's more samples. Like when you say big big, uh, what does it mean? Like eight thousand? Oh, okay. Well, what's, okay. Using? What's what's In roughly what you what you're worried about is cap little n over capital n in this chapter. Mm -hmm. The sample size versus the population size. Mm -hmm. So this is less than one or percent or one tenth of one percent or something that's getting small. Okay? So this is you want this to be less than less than one. So what does that mean? 0 0.01 or 0 0.001 or something like that. Okay? If that's small, then you can roughly think these are being intended. X one to X are roughly and the final population correction would come in. Right? What is the final population correction? FPC is one minus n minus 1 over capital N minus 1, well, that'll be uh, greater than 0.99. Okay, it's not even worth bothering with for most statistical purposes. Okay? If I'm in this, if I'm right there, this. Okay? Alright? So, then you can talk about independence. Okay? Even if they're not independent, so the central limit theory, what you do take into account at least, okay? So there's still a such, you know, result. Cool. But again, that result is only valid essentially if little bit over capital M is small, okay? Okay, so which one of these is better in the independent in normal case? Um, what is, you know, how would you
do this. Now, when you judge, he's just trying to go on your your question. M S E of S squared. This means the expected value of S squared minus sigma squared squared. Okay, that's the oh, definition okay. of it. Okay, of the M S E. Okay, M S E of sigma hat squared is the expected value of sigma hat squared minus sigma squared squared. That's what it is. And remember how we said this is, the last time we derived this is the variance of s squared plus the bias, e of s squared minus sigma squared quantity squared. And this is the variance of sigma hat squared well, you want to that plus the expectation of sigma hat squared minus sigma squared. It's variance plus bias, square of the bias. Okay? And we can actually compute these. They're about the same. Yeah. But you can actually show which one is smaller. Okay? Uh. Variance of S squared, we, we worked that out because S squared is, um, is sigma squared over n minus 1 times the chi square of n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And so actually, you know, sigma hat squared is also, because it's just sigma hat squared is n minus 1 over n times that, so that's sigma squared over n chi square n minus 1. Okay? <laughs> so I actually know the distributions of them. So actually, the variances are actually easy to calculate even, too. So therefore, the variance of s squared, because I know what the variance of chi squared is, just twice the number of degrees of freedom. This is sigma squared over n minus 1 squared, a little practice in computing, remember, times the variance of chi squared, n minus 1, equals sigma to the fourth over n minus 1 squared times 2 n minus 1, equals sigma to the fourth over n minus 1. Okay? And the variance of sigma hat squared by the similar computation. But now it's sigma squared over n quantity squared times 2 n minus 1 equals sigma to the fourth over n squared. Not 2 sigma, I said there's a 2 here. 2 sigma to the fourth, and this is 2 sigma to the n squared times n minus 1. Okay? So it looks very similar, right? When n is little, n is large, certainly it's a big difference. And not, not a big difference, they're almost the same number. Okay? And again, and this bias is 0. This is zero in this case we know. This bias is zero. Okay? And this bias is not zero. Because since that bias is zero, this bias is not zero. And so this bias is what? The expected value of sigma hat squared is um, E sigma hat squared is E N minus 1 over n s squared, which is n minus 1 over n sigma squared. Okay? So the bias is 1 over n sigma squared. So this is 1 over n times sigma squared. Then I'll square it. It is a negative sign. Okay? It doesn't matter how square it is. Okay? So you have a sigma to the fourth over n squared here, very small. Okay? So here the bias is, again, order 1 over n. The standard error of order 1 over the square root of it. That is the, the uh, standard deviation. Standard, this is the variance is order 1 over n. The standard deviation order 1 over the square root of n. So you see what's happening here. The bias is 0. That's really small compared to 1 over n. Okay? And here the bias is 1 over n squared. That's small compared to 1 over n. Okay? The variance is order 1 over n. The bias order. Or zero in this case. Exactly zero. So these are small. And that's why this one's a little bit better. You can actually do the algebra. Okay? You actually compare these two things. I mean, it looks like, you know, it's like, it doesn't make any difference. But it's, it's a little computation, a little algebra here. This works out, therefore, to 2 sigma to the fourth over n minus 1 is the final answer for this MSC. This one comes out to be 2 sigma to the fourth over times n minus 1 over n squared plus sigma to the fourth over n squared. Mm -hmm. So this comes out to be um, 
factor of 2, but there's no factor of 2 here. So let's see, 2n minus 1 plus 1, so this is 2n minus 1 over n squared times sigma to the fourth. What? Okay. Oh. It's still 1 over n, the factor of 2. Um, but look, if the, if the minus 1 wasn't there, this would be 2 over n sigma to the fourth, which is less than that. Okay? So this is even smaller. They got a little bit less here. How is this one? Small. This right. is smaller than that. Okay. Look. Oh, yeah. Suppose I put this up and I made it bigger. Then it's still smaller than that. Mm -hmm. Two over n is smaller than two over n minus one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So it's it's kind of a, a toy point, but there you have it. Compare MSCs. And so what they're getting in these cases, this ratio estimator has a much smaller variance than the simple random sample estimator in most cases, okay, where it's reasonable to apply. So the second one's better, basically what you're saying? Yeah. Just, just so the case second where one's I can biased. Make, case where I can actually, yes. The second one's biased. So the bias, bias is tiny. Oh. So I made it clear. The bias can be tiny, it's still a better estimator. Okay. Now we're going to come up with some, in this net last section we're going to talk about um, some different cases. But how about your homework? Are there more questions about the homework? Has uh, anybody run into any troubles besides? Your homework, I know this is the one I just turned back. You're having a little bit of trouble with the confidence interval still um, on that one. Problem uh, not everybody, but there seems to be some trouble with the confidence interval. Like your problem number. Okay, problem number 14. Nobody seemed to know that you were supposed to estimate the total and then write down the, the normal density for the total. Okay. Um, I think that one came out as problem number 7.14. You had P was given to be 0.654. You were given that N is E for dichotomous variable. <laughs> See, I didn't figure out what. Every time I don't figure out what they're asking for. N was equal to 393, and you were asked to, um, and then you were estimating, estimating. Tau equals capital N P. Okay. Uh, I don't have any other notation for it. Which came out to be um, 257. Okay. There were 257 hospitals, according to the data given, that had fewer than a thousand discharges in the month of January. Okay. Out of the 393, that was just a population parameter fact. Okay. And what you're estimating is you're using, you can try to estimate that by taking n times p hat, capital T, equals n sub p hat, where p hat was based on sample size 25, I believe. Okay. p hat sub 25, if you want to put it there. You didn't okay? give me p hat. Give me. Of course you don't give me p hat. You're just telling me, this is a random variable. When you sample 25 hospitals, you don't know what you're going to get. Oh, okay. What he's doing is saying, I give you the population information. Of course, you don't have the population information in general. Okay? But he just wants to know whether you understand what the heck this is. Okay? So maybe the problem confused you because they're giving you too much information. But they're giving you too much information so that you can actually finish the problem. Okay? <laughs> All right? It's, you understand the concept. You understand the concept. So this is a random variable that has a mean. The mean is 257. Mm -hmm. Okay, in other words, if I take this sample size 25, calculate the proportion of hospitals that actually have fewer than 1,000 discharges in that sample size 25. All right, maybe there are five hospitals out of 25 that have fewer than 1,000 discharges. So I get 20% uh, here, then I multiply by 393, and I get a, a total estimate, and it wouldn't be too good. Okay? 
next time I might get 15 hot, 25 hot spells. Okay? That had to do with it. Then I would have a bit Okay? P hat is 0.67, close to actual P. Alright? So, but if I take the average of all possible, overall possible samples, and there are many, many samples in size 25, 393 choose 25 different possible samples, right? It's a huge number, okay? Remember I was talking about two urns? There's the one urn that has 393 numbers in it, 393 balls. And then there's the other urn, way bigger, okay? That has all samples of size 25. Okay? Mm -hmm. In it. Mm -hmm. 393 choose 25 little brackets. Okay? It has the sample size 25 in it. Okay? And when I'm looking at this expectation, really what I'm thinking about is, say, if I averaged over that whole big urn, okay, expectation over that big fat urn, double E, okay, then I would get 257. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's what we're right now. Alright? Yeah. Okay, so basically every one of these little brackets gives you a number, okay? This, okay? Gives you this number, okay? So I have a random variable from this thing, okay? Actually, I only sample one bracket out of here, okay? If I average all that thing, then I get 257, that's the theory. And the variance was the variance of this thing, which is just n squared times the variance of but you had a formula for that. And so this came out to be, well, this was the square of 393 times the standard error of p hat. Okay? So this came out to be 36.2, I believe, squared. That was the variance. So the, very, the standard deviation of t was 36.2. So I just wanted, so I had the capital T is normal. In other words, the, the numbers that you get by taking the average of these and multiplying by capital N was normal but with mean 257 and variant and variance 36.2 squared. Okay, I just wanted you to graph the normal distribution with these two parameters. Mu equals 257 and sigma equals 36.2. Okay? That's all you really need to do for that problem. The people didn't understand it. A lot of everybody did. Some people, and some people just ignored the total thing. They just went and they the uh, uh, the thing that was normal uh, being 0.654, corresponding uh, standard deviation uh, sigma sub p f, close to the right hand. Just needed to multiply up to yeah, everything by 393. Yeah, I thought about that. Yeah. yeah. Is there any, are there any questions left? And then your confidence intervals, yeah. Uh, people were making computational errors in problem 32 because the sample sizes were different. They were 100 and 200, I believe, not both 200. So I think the sigma, the uh, S of D hat in problem number 32 came out to be 0.042, not 0 0.035. People were using the, the sample, they had using the same sample size from 200 to 200, and I believe they were yeah. 100 to 200. Okay. Well, that was the main thing there. What happens is both 95% and 90% confidence intervals for, for, for the difference of the P's, okay, D equals P1 minus P2. If I actually make the 90% and 95% confidence intervals, even the 90% confidence interval um, does not avoid zero. Slops over to zero. So the confidence interval came out to be, the 90% confidence interval came out to be uh, 0 0.06 plus or minus 0 0.069 or something like that. Okay? Confidence interval from P1 minus P2. Okay? I think it was P1 minus P2. I can't remember exactly what it is. So that slops over zero. So in other words, this confidence interval is consistent with this difference being zero. So consistent with zero means that there's no, I can't uh, argue the significant difference between P1 and P2. People were not nailing the conclusion that well because maybe they didn't remember when they first took the six course. Anyway, you're supposed to try to figure that out. 
95 percent confidence well, certainly is doesn't tell me anything. Okay, that's that's more difficult. That's a, uh, a more significant. Um, that would, if I could tell a difference, it would be a more significant difference. Okay, between people and people here. So I'm looking for a lower percentage just to see whether there's any information at all that people might be two or different. Okay. So, what kind of confidence interval will tell you there are different? Not oh, maybe 80 percent. There might be some different. Just a little bit different. 80 percent confidence interval will tell you they're different. Okay, I'm 80 percent confident that they're different. Okay. And by how much? Not by very much, probably. Okay. That kind of a thing. So, there's just too much variability here that's pointing out. Sample sizes are not big enough to actually conclude that people are in or different. When you're, sampling for, when you're sampling for proportions, you need large sample sizes. So they don't go out and just ask 100 voters who they prefer. Well, they, they only they ask, ask 500 voters. Yeah, that's not very many. You need something like 1,500 to get really a good sample. Yeah, so there's a lot of error. If, if it's, if it's if they're asking 500, then the answer is, well, 70% are for one candidate and 20% are for the other, and it's 10% undecided. No problem, okay? <laughs> but if it's very close, 500 is not near enough, okay? And plus, you know, it's hard to get a good sample. Are you really sampling at random from that, you know, the nice, big, unbiased art? Not really. Elections are a big deal now. We don't even have a clean election, you know, yet. It's going to take 20, 25 years probably to get clean elections. What? You know? Yeah, well, apparently Jimmy Carter goes around the world staging elections and saying the U.S. is way down on the list in terms of the quality of elections. Yeah. Elections? Yeah. We can't elect people. <laughs> you know, we don't know how to do it. <laughs> well, nobody on the West Coast needs to vote because by the time the East Coast is done, it's decided. Well, yeah, there's no <laughs> Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway. Let's, let's go back to Mayor. What is this? But anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So, let's go on to the new stuff. What do you think? Are we ready? Or do we have, we're not, well, we haven't done enough with ratio estimators. Would you like to see some more about ratio estimators? There's just these nasty formulas, basically. Yeah. What you're going to get is you're going to get the variance of a ratio estimator, y bar sub r, is something like uh, it is a 1 over n, there's a finite population fraction, there's a sigma, then there's a bunch of stuff. Six r squared, sigma of x squared plus sigma of y squared minus two r rho sigma x sigma y. Versus, there's the variance of the simple random sample. We only use there's one variable y. Every ball has a number x and a number y on it, right? Every ball in the urn has a, has two numbers on it, and you just forget about the x numbers, okay? When you're doing the simple random sample of the y's, and you simply get uh, one over n, the same finite population correction here, and then you get a sigma y squared. That's what you did here. Okay? And then you divide it? Well, for one of the grand problems, you're supposed to divide this one by that one. Okay? Uh -huh. And see if the ratio is less than one or not. Uh, or get a formula for it in terms of uh, something like uh, cx equals sigma x over mu sub x. This is called the uh, coefficients of variation. Sigma y over mu sub y. Also called the signal to, excuse me, the noise to signal ratio in engineering. Signal to noise ratio? Well, the signal is the mean, okay? The noise is the signal. So this is noise to signal. So sometimes we put it upside down. If you want to talk about signal to noise ratio, SNR, uh -huh. and this is upside down. Okay, this is called a coefficient of variation as it stands. Okay? What? I thought signal. What is signal mu x? This is the terminology. Oh, 
but we use the standard deviate two standard error. It's like sigma of the signal over sigma of the noise. That's power of one over the power of the other. It's not really mean. Oh, is it really? Is those, are those two different uh, standard deviations? What that you're working at? Uh, let's let's talk about it later. I thought it was. I thought the signal to noise ratio was very uh, related to this. Signal Even. signal is. Well, we use power of the total signal, which is also sigma. Well, we use sigma squared of the signal over sigma squared of the noise. Ah, I see. Same. Okay. So total. Oh, I see. There's a variability in the signal as well. Okay, so that's actually so the variance that's over a ratio. The variance. That's a ratio of variances. Yeah. I guess a variance ratio. So I stand corrected. Thank you very much. Is the basic idea in the ratio estimator that you're exploiting the more accurate information in the other variable that you're incorporating into the? In other words, if if Cx is a smaller number, sigma x over mu x is, is smaller, that means you've got basically a tighter standard deviation. And so if that's the case, then you're basically exploiting another parameter that happens to be more accurate than the y that you were originally estimating alone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, there's less variability in the x and also use the fact that they're correlated. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have to be X and Y are correlated, right. right. and yeah. X uh, mm -hmm. doesn't have as much variability. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. Pretty good. That's what you're doing. You, so you, it, it comes out in the wash. At first, the argument is, well, since they're highly correlated, you get a better estimate. But you actually need a little bit more. You actually need the sigma X is less than sigma Y roughly, or the X and your Y being roughly the same. Okay. Let's say. Okay. You know, waving hands a little bit. You need that's coming out in the wash. Okay. We're here. Little r was equal to u, u y over u x. That was the business. Okay. So there's not enough examples to know exactly how some of these things should be. You know how the actual ratio estimator should be behaving in a typical example. But he wasn't talking about inventories where we have a book value and so on. Apparently, there's some value there. Okay. All right. So let's go on. Let's do one more thing. Let's talk about stratified estimates of population. Okay, he's also going to use inventory here. So I'm going to look at problem number 64 as an example. I'll try to key off. The value of an inventory is to be estimated by sampling. Okay. So here's yet another method to try to estimate the population parameter. So. 764 is going to be an example we're going to use. I'm going to have uh, a strata. I'm going to have a so-called strata. That's the plural of stratum. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to have strata. Three strata in this, in this example. I'm, I'm looking at the value of an inventory. And there are items that have book, and they're going to be stratified by book value. So actually, the, the the variable is x according to book value, because otherwise it wouldn't. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So there are two variables, actually hidden. One is a stratum variable. Okay. What are we doing here? So one in an example. So the strat. So there is inventory, and there are items in the inventory. Okay. That have uh, book value of thousand or more, book value between two hundred and a thousand, or book value between one and two hundred. The number n sub l we're going to call it stratum, and that's actually the stratum has an index l. L goes from one, two, and three. Okay. All right. N sub l, the number of items in the inventory. The rule of the game is we're going to know how many there are. Because the idea is we actually know the book values exactly. Okay? They're on a computer and it's easy to look up. So how many of them are a thousand or more in book value? No problem. 
are exactly 70. Okay? <laughs> All right? There are 500 with book value between 200 and 1,000, and there are a whole bunch of, and I don't know what this is an inventory of, but there's a whole bunch of squall stuff. Okay? <laughs> 10,000 items that have book value between 1 and 200. All right? I don't know. You know it would be nice to know what the inventory is or if this was just made up. Now, we also can know, among those, you know, we're not giving all the information about X, but just a certain amount of information about the X value, the book value, okay? Of the two variables, X and Y. And I'm sort of summarizing the information about X that we are going to use here. In each of these subpopulations, I know the mean. So the mean of, of items that have a thousand or more value, we'll call that just mu sub L, equals 3,000, okay? And that's what it is here. Let's say that the items might have ranged to very valuable, but the average was 3,000 there. And what was the standard deviation? That was 1250. Okay? So there could have been some bigger values. Okay? Yeah, everything is going to be in the units here, because otherwise, if I put the variance here, that's going to be just a gigantic number that won't make any sense at all. You know? A couple of millions. All right, I don't have that in there. So the units of dollars here. This is units, this is size, so that doesn't have units, those are just numbers, okay? Then I have, let's say, the average in the next range of, say, 500 and the standard deviation, kind of ordinary looking at 100, and then I had the small values average to um, 90 with standard deviation 30, okay? That was the information of problem number 64. So that's setting up a lot of the notation for this last section. See? So there's a there are subpopulations. L equals subpopulation. L equals L corresponds to subpopulation. So what's our what do we have to do? So the total population is what's the total population? The total population is the sum of the subpopulations. So how many X values were there? How many items in the total inventory? These are disjoint categories, right? There's not supposed to be any overlap. That's the rule of the game. Okay? So N is N1 plus N2 plus N3 equals 10,570. That's 10,570 items in my total population. Okay. And we haven't got to the y values yet. Okay. But how am I going to estimate? And actually, I'm not going to call this x. What? Because I'm going to actually use x as my, in the book, we're going to use x as the, he's going to go back to the first section. When there's only one variable, he calls it x. When there's two x. variables, he calls the variable of interest y. And the other <coughs> variable x. Now, when there's only one variable of interest again, other than the strata variable, okay, he calls it x again. Uh, he likes x over y, okay? I'm probably going to stick with y, then use the x as the auxiliary variable for a while. But um, I'll follow the chapter, okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay. So this is the auxiliary variable variable defining the strata. There might be other way to define strata too. Historical records, what have you. The, this, this, this type of information might be available other ways. Because I'm not using all of the book values. I'm only using some information about the book values. Okay? In this table. Okay. Now, and so this is a total population and then now, what's the total population? And the thing that I'm going to be interested in is the total inventory. All right. I'm going to know capital. I'm going to know capital N1, N2, and N3. And a given problem, I might not know these. Okay. So you might. I, I might not know these. Oh. Okay. In a given problem, because because I might not have that much information. Yes, I would in a book five case. In a book five case, I actually do know them all. Okay. Because it's easy to get. All right. But it, you know, in other applications, I might not you know, actually know it, so they'll have different methods. You know, I just still want to get good estimators. But is it better to take a simple random sample or some other method? Okay, so try and compare methods, and it's easiest to compare methods when I actually do have all the information. Okay, to give me a baseline. What's the what's the mean? I actually want to estimate the total inventory, right? So it would be capital N times mu, where mu is the average value. Of the Okay, what, how could the average value be written out? That would be the summation of all the values. So, XIL is how they write it. First I average over this, first I sum over the subpopulation, which is 
I goes from 1 to capital N sub L, it's double summation here, and then L goes from 1 to, I'll just put in 3 here, there are 3 strata. Okay, otherwise he normally puts a capital L there. Okay? So capital L is the number of strata. Capital L equals 3. Okay? <laughs> and so this would be divided by capital N. Now what I can do is um, rewrite this. This is the sum over the, this is in the case when uh, little l is the third stratum. Let's say this is the third stratum, this is the first stratum, I guess. When little, when I'm at the third stratum, this sum is just the sum of the 70 values that are value in book value above a thousand, but the actual values themselves are the audited values. Right? So, at, so these x's are the audited values. Everybody with me there? Audited values. Which I don't really know. I don't know them, but I have to write down some kind of notation for what they are. Okay? This would be the 70 audited values. When I add them up, what would that actually be? Would that be 70 times 3,000? Right? Because that's how mu sub L is defined. It's defined the total audited value divided by 3,000. Uh, see this? I'm sorry. Yeah, this is actually the. Um, so this is not the average of the book values. This is the average of the audited values. So I really wouldn't know that. Right? I really wouldn't know that. So, is this what they want? Yeah, this is true. This is, um, so these, this, this is the actual audited values. And what I'm doing is that, what he's doing is, is normally you wouldn't actually, so I, I take back what I said. I was confusing myself. You actually wouldn't know these ever, okay, the mu wells and the sigma wells, except perhaps by historical record you get some estimate of them, about roughly what they are, how big they are compared. Oh, one's it's in the thousands, you know, obviously by strata, we would have very the strata rule. Okay, it would have to be over a thousand. Okay, well, maybe, because it's audited value, this is book value. Okay? So the stratum is by book value, but these, the actual parameters here, this is, this is known. Okay, because there's only so many items. Okay? This is known. So this is known, but these two guys, the mu L and the sigma L, these are the audited values. Okay? That's the actual objective variable. Yeah, that's what he means with this thing. So this, everybody clear what this is? So, because throughout this chapter, there's no auxiliary variable. I'm just using the auxiliary variable idea to define strata. Okay, so mu L is. So it's like you. Confused you, I can tell by now. Wow. <laughs> this is totally confusing. I'm sorry, I confused you. Because I made a wrong statement, which I'm not correcting. But these were not, this was not the average book value in this strata. Okay? Oh. This is not the average book value. This is the average objective variable value, okay? Which is given in this example, just so you can actually do some comparisons of methods. If I don't have this information, these two columns, I can't compare methods very well. How can you? Because I'm going to do some different methods for estimating mu. But do we know, like, do we know, like, how many we added it? Or? Yeah, we're going to know the sample size. We're going to know how many we're going to do. Okay. But how should I allocate the sample sizes? So that's the basic method. Should I allocate all the samples to this high stratum and not to down here? Or what should I do? How should I allocate the samples? So basically, we're going to have a three urns. One is size 70, one is size 500, one is size 10,000. I'm going to have a total sample size, a little n, as before. But how many should I sample from each urn? Okay, that's what I'm going to do. Now, mu, I'm writing down here, is that is capital N sub L times mu sub L, all right? Because mm -hmm. that's the average of the audited values. So this is the total number of audited values in the L cell population. So I'm going to divide there, and then this simply becomes the notation. Is this is W L times mu sub L. L goes from 1 to 3. Or W L is the relative size of the L population. So I think W, uh, 
well, this W, this W, one of the, the W's come out to be 0 0.0066, the point, the W's come out to be 0 0.0066, 0 0.0473, and 0 0.9461. Okay, those are the three W's. Yeah, and that's the, like the ends and that column divided by the total? Yeah. Total was 10, 5, 7, 0. Oh. I take the ratios and I get these percentages. Okay? Okay. So they add up to one. Alright? So that's that's all kosher. We don't really so we'll always know the W's. Okay, we'll always know the W's, we'll always know the capital N's. We won't usually know the mu's or the sigmas. Okay? And in this problem, we are giving the mu's and sigma so we can do some comparisons. Okay? So it's one of those things where they actually give you parameters. Right? Otherwise, they're generally just parameters right around in the problem. We have to write everything down in terms of them. Okay? And I never know how to compute with them. Okay? I never know mu. Because how would I know the mu's of L's? Then I would know mu. I wouldn't have any work to do. Okay? So. Well, in hindsight, you didn't know what the UL meant at first, so that's it's fair that I made a mistake, okay? <laughs> I was trying to, so in this example, the strata are defined by an auxiliary variable. In general, they might not be an auxiliary variable. It's just a strata, okay? It's just, okay? The strata is the auxiliary variable, okay? It's just a discrete variable, okay? So everybody can see the setup. Now what I'll do is I'll sample a size little n sub L from each of the urns. Okay? And then I will just come up with independent x bar sub L's. Okay? They're independent because the urns are different. Alright? I'm just sampling from one urn and an independent sample from another urn. Okay? And that's an independent sample from the third urn. Okay? And so those are going to be independent. So the variance of the linear combination is going to be trivial. So here it is. I'm going to take x bar uh, 1 is just, well, this is going to be, I'm going to have x bar sub 1, I think he calls them x bar sub 1, x bar sub 2, x bar sub 3, let me check, check that. Section 7, 5 here. Uh, yes, let's see now. Maybe he doesn't give them any names. Yes, he does call them x bar sub L's on the bottom of page 228. So x bar sub L is going to be uh, sample based on sample mean based on a sample of size little n sub L, okay, from the elf subpopulation. audited values, okay? <laughs> We've only got one variable officially. Only one variable. I'm trying to make the transition from two variables to one variable by bringing the stratum idea. Okay. okay. And so then what I'll do is I'll take my stratified estimator. X bar sub little s, it's called it. This is not for standard deviation, that's for stratified estimator. Stratified estimator of the actual mean inventory value, audited values, okay? Would be simply, I will just take summation, I'll take the, I had the, the means itself, W L mu L here, all right. So we'll just take the same linear combination of x bars. W L times x bars so L. L goes from one to capital L. So this comes out in our example. This comes out simply to um, 0 0.0066 times x bars so one plus 0 0.0473 times x bars so two plus point 9461 times x bar sub 3. There's nothing I can do about that, about those factors. They're just there. Okay? Because 
WL is a given, God given from the very beginning. Once you determine your strata, of course, you, 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 as a statistician, you can define your strata different ways. Okay. This is a reasonable way, though, historically. Well, you got pretty small values, medium values, or high values. Okay? So there might be a reason, reason to do it that way. So the capital W's are determined by your strata and the capital N scale. So those are all known quantities. Those are the gain. These are known. And these are given. Okay? All right. So what is the variance of this thing? And these are independent. The samples within are not independent, okay? But the, these different random variables here are independent. Okay, so the variance would just add. The variance of x bar sub s will simply be w1 squared times the variance of x bar sub 1 plus w2 squared times the variance of x bar sub 2 plus w3 squared times the variance of x bar sub 3. And so, um, and then you can actually substitute what these variances are from the very first theorem, or second theorem, in the chapter. These are just the sigma squared, well, sigma sub L squared, and so on. So this is summation, WL squared, L goes from 1 to capital L. This is sigma L squared, over n sub l and then find the population correction. What's a little? A little l? And the little n is sample size from the null subpopulation. So that's seven. Let's say I took two samples here, eight, 14 samples here, and 90, oh well, no, no, two, 14 out of 100, let's say 100, let's say, um, a few here, a few here, and a lot more here. Okay? For example, that those would be the little ends. Okay? And the sum of the little ends is, is what I call little n. So little n is defined to be n1 plus and so on plus little ends of the L. Okay? Total sample size. So let's let's look at some possibilities. What's proportional sampling? Let's just actually work this problem out. What's proportional sampling? Let's take this example and, and kill it, all right? <laughs> kill it. Well, I mean, just compute everything. Let's compare a couple of methods. I can forget that I even have strat, and I can do simple random sampling here, right? Just forget that I have strat. Just wipe this whole table away, okay? And then I can estimate the mean, okay? Just by taking a simple random sample, let's say I take little n equals to 300. I'm going to let's take. Let's take my total sample size to be 300. Okay. All right. And let's just say, and let's go ahead and write that down. So, then I could, you know, just forget that I have this strata. So, so let's take little n equals 300. Okay. What is the variance of x bar so simple random sample? SRS is what you can put there. Simple random sample. I don't know how to make that bar. Maybe make that little bar. Okay. <laughs> SRS. That's a simple random sample. What's the variance of that? We know that's equal to sigma squared over n times 1 minus little n minus 1 over capital N minus 1 equals sigma squared over 300. What's sigma squared? Now that's a complicated issue. This is 299 over 10, 4, this would be 5, 6, 9. Okay? What's the variance? Actually, I can compute it here in terms of these. Mm, how would you do that? How would I get calculate the population variance? What's the variance of all the audited values? If I know the if I know the variances and the means of the subpopulations, is that enough to know what the sigma squared is? But these are audited values, not yeah. These are the true audited values. These are the true audited subpopulation parameters. If I know all those subpopulation parameters, you these six parameters. What? If I know those six parameters, do I actually know what sigma squared is? Which is take all 10,570 numbers and calculate the variance. How? Add them together. 
Okay? Sigma squared is all 10,570 numbers xi squared, okay? Minus 10,570 uh, well, yeah, 10, times the mu squared all divided by capital 10,570. Okay, okay. Now, I can break this up, this sum of squares, by going into the subpopulations, right? And then I can bring the sigma squares in. And what do I know is that sigma L squared is the mean is, is 1 over n sub L times summation x i l squared, okay, that's the second moment. Uh, see, what I need is this, that's the second moment is equal to sigma l squared plus mu sub l squared, okay? That's what I know. Second moment equals variance plus mean squared, okay? Mm -hmm. So if I write that across, I have the summation x of i and l. This is just on the i goes from 1 to n sub l. Okay, just the subpopulation. This is just the 70 squares in the case of the one subpopulation. So the case of the 70 squares, i goes from 1 to n sub l, is equal to n sub l to 70 times sigma l squared plus mu sub l. And then I'm gonna get out of the, I'm gonna get out of the woods now. Because I know that number and I know both of those numbers. Okay? So I know this sum. Now I can just add all those. I know what the mu squared is too, because I had a mu to it was a WL mu squared. Okay? So let's see, if I plug all that junk in, okay, what do I get? Okay, sigma squared is therefore equal to um, sum of all these, which would be summation n sub l, sigma l squared plus mu sub l squared. L goes from 1 to capital L. All right, but plug in that, that number. Minus capital N times, I'll write mu as summation WL mu L. Uh, is that the way I want to do it? L goes from 1 to capital L. That's probably going to give me trouble dividing by capital N. Okay, this is square. Okay, so I've got a little bit of algebra to do. What's the trouble? <laughs> it's always trouble. This formula won't give me as quickly as I want it to what I want. Okay, that's all right. I have to do more algebra than I wanted to. There's various ways to get to what I want. There's a formula in the book that actually shows you what the answer is. Uh, page, you want to see what the answer is. On the bottom of page 236. what I'm going to get. Okay? Now, I have to get some stuff. Okay, NL, okay, here's the style of computation. Capital NL over little, over capital N is the WL. Or weights, right? So this comes out to be summation WL, sigma L squared plus mu L squared. I'm only summing L goes over the, over the subpopulation index. L goes from capital minus then the summation WL mu sub L, that whole thing's squared. Okay? L goes from 1 to capital L. Now, I can use a simplification, it turns out. Uh, let's see. When I square that thing out, what do I get? Ah. Okay. Now, there's this thing, summation WL mu sub L minus mu squared. If I write that down, L goes from 1 to capital L. What does that give me? Um, well, maybe I should write this times mu. Just I have to write mu as one case like this and one case like that. Oh, yeah, that's tricky. Okay. <laughs> what? Uh, I just want to get the formula they have in the book. Okay, so I get, and see I have WL mu sub L, but that's also the same thing as mu. Mm -hmm. So if I square it, just put one of them as mu. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
yeah. So then I can rewrite this as, there's just a lot, a lot of ways you can rewrite this. That's just a, the way it is. WL signal squared, I'm going to put that one by itself. Okay, then I'll put this other one over here. Plus summation WL mu sub L squared minus WL mu L times mu. Back. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, now I can factor out the WL and have a mu L minus mu and I have a mu L. So this is summation WL mu L squared plus summation WL mu L times mu L minus mu. Now, here's a little dip. Here's the little business. The sum of the mu L minus mu is not zero, but the sum of the W L mu L minus mu is zero. Here it is. Summation W L mu L minus mu is equal to zero. Okay? That corresponds to uh, the sum of deviations is zero. Okay, this is zero because summation WL mu L is mu. Mm -hmm. Summation WL mu is one mu. Okay, because summation of WLs is one. So therefore, what I can do is I can sneak in another mu here if I want. Okay, that won't change it. It'll be zero addition. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What? Yeah. <laughs> So then I can get this is equal to summation WL sigma L squared. You should have seen this type of thing before, WL mu L minus mu quantity squared. Yeah, so there's a little bit of trickery to get this thing to come up with. Why are you sneaking another mu? Because it doesn't add anything. If I put a mu here, mm -hmm. that's a mu, which is a constant, mm -hmm. times UL minus mu times WL. With the summation WL times mu L minus mu is zero. So, so this thing is zero, zero anyways, why did you just add zero? Huh? No, that's not zero because there's a mu L here. Mu L times W L times mu L minus mu is not zero. What? That's... Uh... Oh, okay. There's three factors here. There's only two factors here. Ah. Uh, all right. I'll so anyway, you get this, which looks a little bit nicer. It's a formula. Okay? This is a very... This is a kind of a variability among the mu's. And this is... Because it's a weighted... I mean, this is a variability where there are weights. Right. So you can think of you can think of this really is a variance. If I had if I had if I had seventy mu L's and five hundred let's see mu threes, if I had five hundred seventy five hundred mu twos and ten thousand mu ones, and those those are my cards on you know, those are my you know I just had three types of marbles, okay? One that had mu three marked on it, and there were 70 of those type of marbles. I had mu uh, two marbles, and there were 500 of those, okay? So I just had three numbers, right? In this huge urn, okay? But there were, all, there were very few of these mu three numbers in there, okay? What would be the variance of those numbers? Well, I, I first I have to average all the numbers. That would give me mu. That's exactly what we're doing. That's how we're getting here. Okay? Because it would be, I have 70 of these, 500 of those, 10,000 of those, add them up, divide by 10,570. I would simply get W1 mu1 plus W2 mu2 plus W3 mu3. With these, those W's I have, 0 0.066 and so on. Alright? So if I average these, average is equal to 0 0.0066 times mu3 plus 0 0.0473 times mu2 plus 0 0.09461 times mu3. Okay. Or All right, that's the average of those. And what's the variability among those numbers? It's exactly this. Okay. Um, okay. Exactly that. This is the mean, so I'm subtracting the right thing. I'm going to subtract. So I'm going to take mu3 minus the mean a bunch of times, 70 times basically. But then I have to divide by capital N equals 10,570. The capital N, the denominator, makes that up use of L. Okay? So in other words, just N sub L divided by capital N. That's the variability of these numbers, that pair of numbers. Okay? 
is I'll put this n sub L divided by capital N back as a W of L. Okay, formula look nice. All right? See what I'm doing? So that's actually a variability, okay? Between the means. This is a, uh, this is a, this is just a weighted variability within. So this is a within populate, this is a within subpopulation um, calculation. This is between subpopulations calculation, or components of the variance. So that's actually what I can do, and I can come up with that variance, and that comes out from notes 20. I actually did the computation with those numbers. And that comes out to be, this variance, sigma squared, actually comes out to be equal to, um, well, let's just write sigma. Sigma equals 558.3, the sigma squared is. I want to put it in the units. Sigma comes out to be 558.3, that's on the bottom, uh, it's in the middle, toward the bottom of page 3, is notes. Okay? Assuming that I did the computation correctly. Correctly, it looks about right, though. Okay? So, <coughs> from that formula right there, okay? So I actually had to do this, okay? And I got this, and I took a square root. Okay. So I can, I know what this is there for. This comes out to be, the variance of 300 is 558.3 squared over 300, and the finite population correction, which is kind of small, and I get some number which comes out to be um, thousand nine point six for my variance. Okay, that's in dollars squared. Okay, so that's, that's my variance of that estimator. Okay, so it only sort of makes sense by comparison with another estimator. So what's the variance of the, now suppose I do use the stratified estimator, what's its variance? Well, I have to use some method of allocation, so I'm not going to just use any stratified estimator, I have to figure out how I'm going to allocate the samples. So one method is to just use proportional sample. It turns out it's a decent method. It's not the optimal method, but it's a decent method. Both, I know these are capital N sub L's, so that's the value, value of proportional sampling. At least I know those. I might not know these other parameters. The other, other methods would depend on some knowledge of these parameters. Okay? To be those some signals. But since I know the capital N sub L's, I can just say, well, I'll just sample from uh, the subpopulations according to how big the subpopulations are. So if I had 300 samples, how big should the sample sizes be? It would just be proportional, right? So I would just take proportional sampling, calculate variance x bar sub s stratified, not simple random sample, so s stands for stratified, not simple random sample, example, uh, with little n equals 300 and proportional sampling. So that would be simply little n equals capital WL times, two little n sub L equals capital WL times little n. So that would be equal to 0 0.0066 times 300. Okay. Uh, 0 0.0473 times 300. And 0 0.9461 times 300. Which gives sample sizes are. See, I think I worked this out so I actually got. Yeah. I needed 300 samples in order to get two samples. So 2, 14. And 284. Okay, there's only two samples from the, from the expensive items. Okay, that seems maybe counterintuitive that you would take more than two samples, but this is proportional sampling. Okay, I can erase all this calculation for the sigma squared in terms of those other subpopulation parameters. Okay, we're almost out of time. So when I plug these numbers in now, and I have that um, variance of my x bar sub s. By the way, when he does proportional sampling, he calls it s sub p, stratified proportional. With <laughs> all these subscripts he got to here. s for the general stratified, srs for super random sample. It has nothing to do with stratified. 
SP for stratified proportional, then it's going to have an SO, which I'm not going to get today, which is stratified optimal. Okay? <laughs> okay. So, four different subscripts. One is the general one. X bar sub X is just general. It's just W, L, X bar sub L. Okay? It's the definition of the stratified estimator always. Okay? It's just a matter of the allocation of the sample sizes that makes a difference with different estimators. And, of course, the allocation, there's only one stratum in the simple random sample case. So we just throw away the general stratification. This one, therefore, is 0 0.00. We said we squared the name WLs, and then you had your sigma sub L squared. So that would be a 1250 squared over 2. Okay? Then the time to find a population correction, which is 1 over 10,000. So the subpopulation being small means the final population character is kind of Plus 0.0473 squared times the 100 squared over 14. All right, that's the basic variance calculation. Times 1 minus uh, final population correction. This time is 13 over so 14 samples from 500. 1,000, Okay. <laughs> okay. Alright, what does this come out to be? Well, actually, there's three numbers that add up. The biggest one is the first one, because the sample size is so small, only two. Okay, so the three numbers you add up here, they come out to 33.76 the biggest one, and then 1.56 plus 2.76. This is all in variance calculation, so this is the square unit, 38.07. Okay? So that's much, much smaller than this. 30 times smaller. Well, maybe not 30 times. 26 times smaller. That means with proportional sampling, you could have done 26 times fewer samples. So what? You could have used 26 times fewer samples. You could have used 15 samples instead of 300. Okay? You got the same results as I would have given a random sample. So it's, a, it's huge savings in terms of samples to do something when you have this strategy. This is just an example where you know you actually knew the mu and the signals, so you could actually compare the two things. And if you actually go to optimal sampling, it's even it's even eight times better than the proportional sample. Wow. Okay. Of course, you're never going to know the actual mules and signals. So how would you know? How do you get optimal samples? But still, it's an interesting calculation to see what you would get. How can you not go a mu L? The mu L is what you get. No, that's what audited. This is the actual variable of interest subpopulation means. If you know all those, you know mu. You don't listen to estimate. You don't know the value of all these 70, uh, you know, like you know, Ferraris and whatnot. Oh, okay. so there the, <laughs> So you actually have somebody audit everything and then divide by 70? Yeah. For each category? Yeah, you were in 500 and 10,000. Yeah, you would actually have to know that to actually know those. Okay. And what's the point? But, it, but, but you could still, let's say you knew roughly, you know, what the mu balls are roughly, you know, in terms of by the book value. Suppose instead of the mu wells, I put book value counts. Okay, then I can get some rough idea of which one is which one is better and how much better optimal sampling is. So you could I didn't use the book value series. I could use a book value series. Just that the actual formulas that I came with here wouldn't be correct. I could use the book value views and the book value sigmas, but then my formulas or the variances of my Estimators wouldn't have been correct. All right. Okay. So that is today. So tomorrow we'll 
finish up uh, this section and uh, we'll get the practice exam and hopefully everything will be clear. Oh. <laughs> so for this, from this section, I'm not sure exactly what information I'll put on the final, but I'll make that decision by Thursday. I'm going to give you the table, page 214, one variable case. For the two variable cases, I don't know what I'm going to give you. So the I give, I'll give you one formula, probably for the ratio estimator. Final is not cumulative, right? No, this is after six and seven. Oh.